Here's a controversial opinion. Porn is not a problem, but how you use it might be. Hi, I'm Dr. Kevin Jensen, and I help Christian men integrate faith and sexuality so they can experience sexual satisfaction instead of shame. You can find my work online at courageousintimacy.org. One of the most controversial conclusions I've come to in my work is that pornography is not a sin. The way that many people use pornography, though, is problematic, and some porn is produced in ways that exploits others. However, this is true for everything from coffee to your latest Amazon order to what you ate for breakfast. So what's the difference between these and why do I disagree with all the teachers out there who rail against the evils of pornography while failing to think twice about what they ate for breakfast or how they acquire clothing and kitchen gadgets? Let's dive into three examples and see if we can understand the difference between consuming sugar, coffee, free shipping, and pornography. Example number one, sugar. Many people are ignorant about the body and how to honor its appetite for food, so there is an overconsumption of sugar and other stimulants in the United States. The sugar problem is mostly invisible because people are unaware of the link between stress, obesity, and the unending craving for sweet things. For many people, sweet foods are a coping mechanism for emotional pain because they release a dopamine rush in the body. Some people, though, feel a sense of shame over their size. But this is mostly caused by artificial standards of beauty rather than by a value for health, and I applaud the movement toward a broader appreciation of beauty. Does this mean that we should admire unhealthy bodies or fail to consider the impact of our eating choices? Example 2. Coffee dependency is so common that people will joke about their addiction. I have never heard someone talk, though, about the evils of coffee and how it should be banned because so many people struggle to drink responsibly. Going further with this example, I'm curious why there is no moral outrage over the altered psychological state brought about by caffeine. The energy levels it artificially produces in the body can be a coping mechanism to ignore the body's true need for sleep, and too much can cause adrenal fatigue. Wouldn't it be better to just get plenty of rest and nutrition? After all, a lot of coffee we consume is produced in ways that exploit others. Why are there no online coaches helping people overcome their coffee addiction as a way to end the epidemic of overconsumption? Instead, we have a popular movement toward distributing coffee that is produced using fair trade and profit sharing with local regenerative farmers. What if we tried this with more than just coffee? To be fair, I was drinking a cup of coffee as I wrote this outline. The flavor, the smell, and the stimulus bring a lot of focus into my day as well as joy. It also makes my voice sound bassy, which is great for producing video content. Now, before I get into why I think pornography is not a problem, let's look at example three, shopping online. It's hard to beat two-day shipping and shopping without having to leave home, but there is a risk to entering the online portal of greed called Amazon. Marketing algorithms are designed to lure us deeper and leave us wanting more. The more we buy, the more we want. It is impossible to be satisfied, so our houses fill up with cheap stuff that is produced in ways that harm the environment and are delivered by a company known to exploit its workers. I don't know of any preachers getting famous for arguing that online shopping is a sin. People would probably laugh. Online shopping is necessary in some ways, just as hot drinks and sweet foods are part of the human experience. I don't think sugar is evil. I don't think coffee is evil, and I don't think affordable prices are a sin. So what makes pornography so different? Is it the fact that many people consume too much pornography until it produces unhealthy effects in their bodies, like sugar? Is it because of the psychological changes that happen in the brain, like with coffee? Is it because a lot of pornography is produced in ways that exploit others, like cheap products? People who say pornography is evil for these reasons need to have more integrity with the rest of their lives. If there is such a thing as a porn problem, there is also a sugar problem, a coffee problem, and a shopping problem. I agree that all of these things can be problematic, but the issue is with the person who uses them and the person who produces them. The problem is not the sugar, coffee, 
cheap products, or porn. When these things are created in ways that exploit or, exploit or harm others, I will avoid them. When I find I can't go more than three days without coffee, I'll cut back. When I can't stop eating snacks, I will check in with my body about the nutrition it needs. I try to limit my purchasing of things to what I need and things that are produced in responsible ways. But the conversation about pornography misses these important things because it got stuck with the label of sin and the accompanying social stigma. In contrast with the coffee addiction, nobody jokes about the porn addiction, even if they are careful to consume only products that have been ethically produced. Why? Why should it be more difficult to say that I watched porn last week than to mention that I went to a coffee shop yesterday? I can think of a few reasons, but feel free to add yours in the comments. The first reason I have is probably the most important. Nobody has a framework for a healthy use of porn. Let me use an example of alcohol to explain what I mean. There's some things I would talk about at a convention of brewery professionals that I would never mention at a meeting for Alcoholics Anonymous. In one context, there is an understanding of the art, the joy, and the wholly integrated approach to alcohol. In the other, people have only experienced its harmful effects. I may have enjoyed a craft beer last night and have a dream of owning a vineyard when I'm an old man, but this is not something I will mention in a context of people who have struggled to limit their intake of alcohol. Wine can be a beautiful part of the human experience, but not when it makes a person feel out of control and act in ways that harm themselves or others. I can only talk about how much I enjoyed that alcoholic beverage with people who also know how to enjoy it responsibly. There is no such responsible context for porn. Most of the people who talk openly about their enjoyment of porn do so in ways that are demeaning to their humanity and to others. They even use it in ways that exploit others, harm their brains, and teach their bodies unhealthy patterns. This dearth of healthy examples leads to a false dichotomy, that one must either avoid porn altogether, or use it in unhealthy ways. All porn is therefore exploitive, harmful, and demeaning, so nobody should use it, ever. It is a similar argument to banning guns or burning cars because both have led to the deaths of many people. Traffic accidents and gun violence are terrible things, but they are caused by poor driving and troubled characters. We need more responsible drivers, not people arguing about the evils and dangers of motorized transportation. Guns may be a different story, though, because they lack a functional purpose outside of violence. They are made to kill things, whereas cars are made for another purpose. What about pornography? Is it like a vehicle that can help someone go places and unlock meaningful experiences? Or is it like a gun, which has an inherently destructive purpose? In other words, is pornography accidentally destructive or inherently destructive? We cannot answer this question without first addressing the problem of media. And if you're curious to go deeper with this, I've covered it in several sections of an unpublished manuscript called Love, Lust, and Power, Rethinking the Christian Approach to Porn. It's not published, so you'll have to message me directly and ask for it, but it explores this problem of media in detail. So what about media? And let's begin by asking, what is the benefit of storytelling? Is there a difference between history and fantasy? What is the purpose of poetry? Is the production and portrayal of beauty a sinful distraction from the heavenly gaze to which Christians are called? The church community I grew up in believed that movies, music, dance, and fantastical stories had questionable value. We should be spending our time in work prayer or going to church instead of feeling the emotions of joy, the freedom of movement, or the expansion of our imagination. We lived in the real world of biblical facts instead of the lies of fiction. But somehow, symphonies were okay. Choreographed actions were fine. Watching movies about World War II was entertaining. And Da Vinci's Last Supper had a prominent place on the kitchen wall. The real problem was we didn't know the difference between using fiction to escape reality 
and using it to experience the beauty of reality more deeply. We didn't understand that sometimes it's okay to drop into a storyline and forget about the rest of life. It's okay to get lost in the moment and be carried on the wings of imagination to other worlds where inspiration awaits. We didn't understand the power of words to activate emotion, feelings, relationships, and the bliss of life. Am I suggesting that pornography has capacity to do all this? Perhaps. But I will give one more example first that shows the dangers of fictional media, including pornography. Several fantasy books were allowed in my childhood library because they described people doing admirable Christian deeds. I consumed hour after hour of their heroic adventures full of love and courage. But this did not inspire me to live with these characteristics. It only made me frustrated that these things were not part of my life. I was deeply unhappy with my waking world and the only time I could feel alive was in a story or in a dream. The fantasy world was better than my reality and I didn't know how to create a better life for myself. I escaped into my brain and forgot how to function in relationship with other people. And I'm not talking about porn. I'm talking about Christian books. This is the danger of media. This is also why pornography is a problem for most people for the same reasons. It portrays a fiction that is better than reality and leads the person to escape from life rather than learning how to enhance it. This is also true about movies, computer games, virtual reality. It's easier for us to consume a storyline that makes us feel good than to create a life that is full of joy. The emotions are real. The mirror neurons in our brain release the chemicals that flood the body with happy hormones and we return again and again for another hit. The same thing can happen with plant medicines. The same thing happens with coffee, with shopping, with sugar, and even with going to church. The reward system of the body is designed to lead us toward things that release positive emotions and happy neurochemicals. And the reward systems attached to sex and orgasm are perhaps the most powerful of all. Modern society has been designed to activate this reward system with the push of a button, the click of a mouse, which can be problematic. It is easier to binge watch a TV show about dating than to activate the same neurotransmitters by asking someone out and talking to them for a couple of hours. It's easier to read Fifty Shades of Grey than to learn the art and science of the practices it describes. It's easier to jump out of a helicopter in a video game than to build the muscle required to climb a real mountain. The virtual reality of words, pictures, movies, and now even artificial intelligence can help me achieve the rewards of hard work without any of the effort. The only problem is my body was designed for nutrition, not just for sugar, for sleep, not just for coffee, for creating things, not just acquiring cheap goods, and for sexual intimacy, not just sexual arousal. All of these things can be good and enjoyable pleasures when they are in their place, but it is easy to settle for partial satisfaction than to put forth the effort to create a healthy body, mind, spirit, or relationship. Does this mean that the manufacturers of sugary breakfast cereals are evil? No. They are responding to the natural desires and impulses of the body. A quick sugar rush can be helpful in certain situations. Should we boycott Starbucks? Caffeine can lead to mental clarity. It can be helpful to escape reality from time to time in the halls of Netflix and find inspiration at a Barnes & Noble. A rush of sexual energy through the body can open the door to a good night's sleep and sexual fantasy can unlock a world of erotic creativity. There are benefits and risks to every form of media, and it is important for us to learn how to use each one in a way that leads to a better life. But as a Bible scholar, I have two remaining points to make before I wrap up. Because porn may not be a problem, but doesn't God say 
It's a sin. The Bible doesn't talk about Amazon, Netflix, or General Mills, but it does talk about something called adultery. And there is a whole list of people in the book of Leviticus that one should not look upon in their birthday suit. In short, the question, doesn't the Bible say it's a sin to see naked people or to be sexually aroused by someone you're not married to? These are important questions, and I'm so glad you're asking. The short answer to both of them is no. Surprisingly, right? The biblical sexual ethic emphasizes two things. Do not steal someone else's property, adultery, and do not be overcome by your desires. This has to do with the word lust or pornea. Unfortunately, these biblical teachings on adultery and sexual immorality come to the modern church through a lens of Victorian Europe and Puritan colonialism that forgot how to have a healthy view of the body. Michelangelo's nude cherubims would never be painted on the ceilings of a modern evangelical church because we have no context for appreciation of the body in a way that is not distorted by sexual lust. Secondly, we've misunderstood the word lust in the Bible. It is something that Jesus does and something that the Spirit does as well. The word lust does not refer to sexual desire but to powerful desire. And it's connected to the word porneia, which means to be dominated by that desire. The use of fornication entered the biblical text in its translation to the English language, and it has led to the unfortunate assumption that married and moral are the same thing when it comes to sex. You can see my early presentation on this research if you go to my YouTube channel. It is my most popular video. If you're curious to know all of the details, though, I wrote a whole book called Sacred Not Sinful, A New Christian Sexual Ethic. This book takes you on a deep dive into theology, philosophy, history, and the biblical text in order to understand and conclude that Christians are called to lives of self-control and to express love for God and for others in all things. Married sex is not the same thing as moral sex. And there is a purpose and meaning to human sexuality beyond what most people have ever imagined. You can find out more and get a free sample of the book at sacrednotsinful.com. But more importantly than unraveling the ideas and these stories that we've told ourselves for centuries, I want to help you experience sexual satisfaction instead of shame. This video is just another form of media. And it's possible to consume these ideas without ever making a change in your own life. Learning new things can be liberating and rewarding, but it is also futile if you don't know how to put the theory into practice. That's why I've created a community for Christian men who are committed to cultivating integrity, freedom, and skill in our bodies, minds, spirits, and relationships. This is what it takes to experience sexual wholeness. We cannot be ignorant about how the body works. We have to understand the stories the brain tells us and how our reward systems work. We have to recognize the spiritual dynamics of sexuality and we have to learn the skill sets of healthy relationships. Without these tools, fantasy, media, including pornography, will always be the easier choice. Pornography may not be a problem, at least not all of it. But unless you cultivate this whole healthy experience of your sexuality, pornography will always be a problem for you. If you're ready to take the first steps towards sexual freedom and wholeness with a community of Christian men to support you with the tools, resources, practice, and encouragement you need, I invite you to join me at CourageousIntimacy.org. To wrap it all up, let's summarize what we talked about in this video. First, we looked at how sugar, coffee, and even our shopping habits can be problems, even though they're not a problem all by themselves. The problem comes from using them in ways that lead to a harmful impact on ourselves and on others. Second, we looked at the problem of media and how fantasy is an easier path to our body's reward system than the hard work required to create a beautiful life. Finally, 
we looked at the question of whether pornography was a sin and found out that Christians believe it is because of a mistaken reading of the Bible and an unhealthy view of the human body. The most common reasons for given that people give for why pornography is a problem implicate every part of life. And this leads us to our conclusion that sexual wholeness is not just about avoiding porn. It's about learning how to live with integrity, freedom, and skill in every part of life. Sign up to join my community of Christian men on this journey to integrate faith and sexuality at discover.courageousintimacy.org. I'm on a mission to help Christian men experience sexual satisfaction instead of shame. Reach out if there's anything I can do to support your journey.